this lecture, we're going to learn a little bit more about how evolution can proceed in a much more quick fashion than using lots and lots of time. And then we'll finish off learning about, though, how what is the evidence as to why this Earth is really, really old. So a couple of the things I wanted to talk about are, first of all, the idea of what is called exaptation. Exaptation is simply where a characteristic that was originally evolved for one function then takes on a new function. A great example of this is feathers in birds. Feathers were originally evolved not for flight, but they have now become an excellent um, adaptation, a structure that is used on wings and on the outside of birds to facilitate flight. So they are, they, we can then say that feathers were exapted for flight. And so this is kind of like stepping stone evolution. You can really jump from one function of a, of a structure to another function of that same structure in almost leaps and bounds, which can then move evolution at a, at a much quicker pace. Another way in which evolution can move very quickly is through the field of what we call evo-devo, or development in evolutionary biology. And what happens is that all organisms have a set of genes that are major control genes that then turn on other sets of genes like cascades, almost like dominoes, like you start this one gene and it has a domino effect on a bunch of other genes. And if you change, even very subtly, those major control genes, you can have huge differences in the organism um, downstream. So an example of this is pedomorphosis where you get juvenile fe features in an adult. So this is um, a, a relative of salamanders, but it never goes through its metamorphosis and actually becomes the adult salamander. It rather stays as a essentially a, the body form of a newt, but is reproductively active, so is an adult in the juvenile form. And this occurred because of slight changes in some of the de de developmental genes that allowed this organism to become sexually mature while still in the juvenile form. And so that type of very quick evolution can occur when subtle changes happen in developmental genes. Just a few more examples of this. If you just simply change the way genes are turned on and turned off, or the speed at which they're turned on and turned off, you can essentially take fish that maybe had, some, look, had this shape and then look something more like this, or maybe a fish that was elongate and now it's a little bit more robust, or a fish that was short and now it can be much longer. This is also how we explain the differences in the chimpanzee and adult human craniums when compared to the fetal proportions. You can see that chimpanzee and human fetal proportions in our craniums are essentially the same, very similar. But as we grew to the adult, genes turned on that allowed the uh, jaw to become enlarged while the, you know, the um, cranium did not, did not become so enlarged. And in humans, we really have um, maintained uh, the proportions of the human fetus head. So you know, we really are kind of just baby heads. And, we, and the way that this is done, you go from this to this simply by turning on these major control genes in different ways, or from this to this by turning on or off these major control genes in different ways. So not all evolution then ha requires lots amount of time, but most evolution does. And so it's important to establish the fact that this Earth is really old, and therefore evolution as an explanation for the diversity of life is the best explanation because there has been enough time for it to have shaped the organisms on this planet. So we're going to talk just for a moment about the geologic time and, the, and, and briefly uh, maybe introduce some other things about the fossil record. So when you tell time, there are two ways of doing it, relative dating and absolute dating. In, in relative dating, where you're simply trying to figure out are things older or younger to something else, there is one main principle that is used over and over again by geologists, and this is called the principle of superposition. And it's simply just where you have, if there is an, a sequence of layered rocks, the oldest rocks are at the bottom and the youngest are at the top. So, you know, the Carmel formation here is much, much older than the Lewis Shale formation. And each of these, as whatever is on top, is just a little bit younger than what, what is below it. 
So that's fine if you just go out to one rock, one, you know, one mountain and look at that, but how do you then put together you know, the puzzle of all of the different rock formations across all of the earth? Well, this is another principle that geologists use called correlation. So you know, you look at this simply, if you look at this broken piece of rock, you can see that this piece right here, all we would need to do is kind of shove, shove that up and we would um, be able to correlate this rock piece with this rock piece. And so you do this across multiple rock formations. So starting at Bryce Canyon National Park, way up here, you can go from the Wasatch Formation clear down to the Navajo. And then you can connect that to the Navajo Sandstone at Zion National Park and go down to the Kaibab. And then that can be connected to the Grand Canyon. And then you can work yourself your way out and, and so forth. And eventually, what the geologists have done is they have put together um, a relative dating of all different rock formations across the entire planet. So things can be relatively older or younger than something, but what we really want to ask is how old is the earth? And then of course can once again can we trust the data and the hypotheses that are being put forth? And so to do this the process that we use is called absolute age determination. And there's lots of different ways to do this. You know, you can look at thickness of sedimentary rocks or tree rings or ice cores. But the most common way that this is done in geology is through radiometric dating. And this is where you um, take advantage of the fact that elements in nature that are radioactive decay over time. And they decay at a very constant rate over time. So you um, get, you know, if you have carbon-14, which is a radioactive element, it decays over time. Some of that is in the atmosphere when this organism was made, this bivalve here. And most of the organism is made up of carbon-12, but there is a little bit of carbon-14. And over time, the carbon-14 decays into carbon-12 at a, at a clock-like rate. And in fact, it's every 5.6 thousand years, half of the amount of the carbon-14 becomes carbon-12. And so when you dig up, dig up the clam, you know, many thousands of years later, you can look at that clam and look at the relative amounts of carbon-14 to carbon-12, and that will tell you how many half-lives that um, clam has gone through. So, for example, if only 25% of the, the carbon-14 was left, then you know that it has gone through two half-lives, because one half-life would be 50% is left and two half-lives is 24% or 25%. So therefore, the date of this clam would be 11.2 thousand years. And that's as simple as it, as it is. So sometimes though, the um, fossil that you're looking up is much older than just a few thousand years. And so therefore, carbon-14 to carbon-12 um, system does not work. You need a element that decays at a much slower rate in its half-life. And so that's where we use other isotopes like uranium to lead or potassium to argon. And these have um, half-life years that are much, much longer. So the carbon-14 uh, to carbon-12 system only works for maybe up to 100,000, 150,000 years. If you want to go any older than that, you have to use other things. So we don't use carbon to date actually really, really old rocks. In fact, you don't use it to date rocks because rocks don't have carbon in them anymore. Uh, no organic carbon, they, they've all fossilized away. So we actually use these other systems. And this is how we've actually determined the age of the Earth um, at, at being four and a half billion years old. And we've been able to date all of the different rock layers and the associated fossils that are found in all of these rock layers. So we know that the Earth was formed you know, 4.6 billion years ago. And then it took about a, a, a billion years before we even had um, what we would call cells on the planet. So life did not begin for about a billion years after the Earth solidified. And then, you know, it took another billion years to get the first eukaryotic fossils, and then another uh, billion years or so to get the first um, mul um, multicellular fossils and and it wasn't until fairly recently in, in geologic terms that we get animals that start to you know have body parts that are left sides and right sides and appendages and so forth and heads that start to look like things that would be somewhat recognizable and from that point then you had diversification and diversification of all of the different types of animals and plants 
and uh, other organisms on this planet. So the geologic time scale has been demonstrated both in its age and in this relative dating that therefore puts in place all of the organisms, their fossils, and when they lived and how old each of these are. So evolution truly does have enough time to be the, the best explanation for the diversity of life on this planet. But don't forget that evolution can also occur at very fast speeds as well.